I'm, I'm so delighted that Aaron's with us tonight. Um, I do a lot of work in media and messaging, and Aaron's pretty much my go-to if I want to know anything about climate, if I want to check any of the facts, uh, if I want to say anything, I run it past Aaron. So uh, basically, I really rate him. Um, he got his PhD in ecology from the University of Sheffield, and then he went on to study and research the impacts of global warming on the carbon cycle in the Arctic. Uh, at Edinburgh University. And I think it's safe to say that his studies have led him to be extremely concerned, like Roger would call that um, Oxbridge language for freaked out, about the impacts of the disruption on our climate. So he's a passionate advocate for environmental and social justice, because I think once you understand what's unfolding, you can't be one without the other. And he's also one of the co-founders of Scientists for XR. So, Aaron, thank you so much for being here tonight, and I promise to be on the whole call next week. Over Thanks, to you. Sarah. That's really kind of you to say so. Um, okay, I'm going to put up the slides now. So, you know, this is going to be quite a heavy lecture. I'm not going to shy away from the, telling the, the scientific uh, realities here. So, um, you know, if anybody needs to check out drop off the call whenever, that's totally fine. You know, it's more important that you, you prioritize how you're feeling and, and make sure that you're comfortable with, with the pace that we're going through things. Um, you know, this is really, I think, quite demanding to take in on a regular basis. And um, I myself have struggled with that at times. So, you know, I totally understand if anybody just wants to, to leave that uh, and, and go and do something else. So don't, don't worry if that's what you wanna do. Okay, here we are, 2022. And um, this is this is where we're at. Okay, so starting in the last year, what have we seen? Um, you know, March last year, climate crisis, Amazon forest tipping point is looming. Data shows. April, climate change, IPCC scientists say it's now or never to limit warming. May, climate change is making record-breaking heat waves in India and Pakistan one hundred times more likely. June, Utah's Great Salt Lake is disappearing and could turn the region into a toxic dust bowl. July, the UK reaches hottest ever temperatures as 40.2 40 degrees Celsius is recorded at Heathrow. August, Pakistan floods. One third of the country is underwater, says Minister. September, climate change, six tipping points likely to be crossed. October. UN says countries' <laughs> climate plans are nowhere near the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal. And during COP27, loss of Arctic summer sea ice inevitable within 30 years, report. And going into 2023, climate change is driving millions to the precipice of raging food catastrophe. Half of the glaciers will be gone by 2100, even under Paris, 1.5 degrees Celsius accord, study finds. Rising seas risk climate migration on biblical scale, says UN chief last month. So here we are, and we're at a moment to be alive, eh? Um, you know, this is, the, this is what's unfolding all around us on an everyday basis. And what I'm trying to set out in this lecture is really the case that, you know, we are now in a scientific in a climate emergency, right? The future is being decided as we speak. This is humanity's moment. And if we don't seize it, then, you know, we are <laughs> just gonna see what, what I was just showing you getting worse and worse and worse. So let's take a step back. This is this is where I grew up actually, uh, in the Nant Francon Valley in the Dufferin Ogwen in, in Snowdonia in North Wales. And my, my parents' house was right at the bottom of, um, this valley up the, in those trees. So I used to spend a lot of time climbing up the hills as a teenager. I was really lucky to be able to do that. And um, it's what got me into science, right? This, this landscape, studying it, how it formed, the ecology of it, the geology of it. I became fascinated by it really. And, and that's what led me to go and study um, zoology initially and then ecology and then earth system science. And, you know, I would spend a lot of time sat up on top of these mountains, like I said, contemplating it. And it really helps, I think, connect you <laughs> to this sense of deep time, right? The, the sense that the earth is, has been formed over, over eons and um, that this landscape has, has been 
changing massively uh, over, over that time. Um, so, you know, if, if we just all think about it and, and just all take a breath in, right, like that, you know, then we're all breathing in the gases that are in the atmosphere, all circulating around, connected to everything else. And it's those gases that we know ultimately can change the entire temperature of the planet, right? So everything is kind of connected in the Earth system. Whether or not we look straight down below us to the kind of the volcanic activity that made some of these mountains and is currently churning away, driving continental drift and so on, or look up straight into the sky and think about, you know, um, the outer space and just how thin the atmosphere really is, right? We're living on this kind of crazy band uh, of life <laughs> uh, on a planet, uh, you know, floating in space. And, and when you look at the Earth, you know, as, as we can now from space, and you see it as a whole, right? You see it as this connected single system. And that's what Earth system science is really about. It's trying to understand the Earth from that perspective. And it's, you know, this, this jewel, right? This, this precious uh, um, place with this oasis in space. Um, and yet, you know, looking further and further away, right? This is from Cassini. And you can see the pale blue dot, right? That's us. You know, this, this only place that we know in the universe that supports anything like complex life, right? So, you know, uh, um, it's, it's a miracle, right? And I think that, that has always stayed with me in this sense of wonder and the sense of specialness and this, the miracle that we're, we're, that we're here at all. And so, you know, we can study the, these systems um, and, and try and understand how the earth works. How did, how did life come to be on this planet? How, how does it still exist and, and, and how does it manifest, right? Those are all for me, <laughs> fascinating questions that, that led me into this area and this video kind of shows you um you know our understanding of this system as a, as a single system so you can see you know the winds blowing around the planet and um, in the red here you've got the dust being blown off the sahara and you've got in the yellow kind of these volatile organic compounds um and then you've also got in you kind of got the blues of, of the sea salts being whipped off of the oceans and so on and the fires in the red uh, um, uh, dots on the on the land surface right so it's showing you how the planet is kind of inter interrelated and everything is connected together and the processes in one part of the planet affect processes in, in the other parts of the planet right and we can study these processes um, using satellites using models and they kind of show us different insights about the earth system um so here we've got um you know the winds moving around the planet we've got this different sea surface temperatures and all the different currents that there are this is kind of in the optical looking at what the colors of the earth look like then this is the biosphere so you know the earth's um greening and and photosynthesis and then soil moisture and precipitation and the clouds right and the water in, in the atmosphere, right? So, so we, all of these things are, are connected. And, and if we change some of them, then the other ones change, right? And that's what we mean when we talk about the earth as a system. And there's kind of several key subsystems of the planet. Um, and these then are, you know, the, the rocks, the lithosphere, um, the, the kind of climate, the atmosphere, uh, the hydrosphere, the water cycle, cryosphere, the the uh, ice systems and then of course the biosphere life which kind of ties that all together through the uh, through the carbon cycle and we learn about these at school right so the earth system um you know here's a diagram of the water cycle this one's of the carbon cycle nitrogen cycle the phosphorus cycle right and it's it's how these cycles interact with each other that then maintain the stability of the whole earth system and yet obviously <laughs> we're massively now in interfering with all of these right and then and what drives these cycles and, and is a key component of all of these cycles of course is life is biodiversity is is nature and you know all of the myriad of species each play different roles have different functions within this total system and you know co coexist together so if we take a piece of forest for example we can think of all the individual different trees in that forest right and they're all there um, trying to reproduce, trying to grow, and you know they each have their um, their own special niche 
within that in environment, right? But each individual tree is drawing up water from the, the ground up its stem and then going out the leaves through evapotranspiration and exchanging with the atmosphere, right? And so these trees are bringing up water from their environment, putting it into the atmosphere where it condenses and forms as rain. And over an entire biome, you know, this is talking about billions of liters that are being recycled that can create entire climates across continents. And that's all been driven by life, right? And this is life that has existed for hundreds of millions of years that has evolved um, and developed and become more complex and more interdependent over that time. Um, and yet we also know from studying the fossil record and all of the different kind of eons in the past that there have been key times where the earth system becomes dysregulated, it, it breaks down. And there's these mass extinctions that wipe out much of life and the planet kind of gets reset to a much more um, simple and, and uh, you know, less complicated state, one which we, we wouldn't uh, want to see at all. So, you know, the geologists like, like um, uh, go out there and they study these, these, these historical um, eons and, and eras and the climates of those eras through looking at the rocks, right? And they break down those, those eras into different time zones. Um, we call them different things like the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Silurian, and they just tell us the age of these, these rocks going back hundreds of millions of years, right? The most recent kind of period that we've been in is the Cenozoic. Uh, that's the last 65 million years since the dinosaurs got wiped out, right? And all of mammals and everything evolved in just that 65 million years of kind of the kind of the diversity of, of mammalian life that we see today. Um, but uh, you know, just if we go uh, just to the last two million years, the Pleistocene. And that's kind of the time that humans evolved, right? That's the, the era of, of humanity. And only in the last 10,000 years have we actually had human history uh, in the forms of human civilization and settled agriculture. It's a really, really tiny time interval in, in this kind of sense of deep time, right? Um, but we're now leaving that, that Holocene, that, that last 10,000 years. And instead we're entering what is called the Anthropocene, right? So this is um, what, uh, an influential panel of, of uh, uh, geologists have, have put together a kind of a, an analysis to say, you know, humans are having such a huge impact now on the planet that, that we should start thinking of it as a completely functioning in a different way. Um, so, um, you know, th they're saying that um, this new era uh, started in the mid 20th century when a rapidly rising human population accelerated the pace of industrial production and the use of agricultural chemicals and other human. So what we're seeing here is huge changes, right? Really drastic changes in key components of both the human system and also then the earth system, right? So the, the, the growth in the human population, in, in GDP, um, you know, investment, urban population, energy use, fertilizer consumption, they've all kind of grown exponentially over the last um, few decades. And as these things have grown, as the human footprint has grown, then so has the environmental impact. So carbon dioxide emissions, nitrous oxide emissions, methane, stratospheric ozone um, was getting depleted. Sea surface temperatures are going up, ocean acidification and so on. They're all increasing, right? And we call this kind of the great acceleration. This is the idea that humanity is having this really um, drastic and, and um, massive impact on the Earth's environment. And just to put this into to kind of really stark terms, I think when you stop and think about what's, what has humanity already done uh, uh, in this time, um, and I think we need to be a little bit careful of using humanity too generally, right? Because this isn't everybody, it's, it's certain, uh, certain uh, social groups, right? But, um, you know, we felled half of all the forests on the planet. You know, two thirds of all the longest rivers have been dammed. We've likewise lost two thirds of all wetlands. It's been destroyed. We now shift 10 times more material than all of the world's geological processes combined through mining and, and excavation and so on. We've now increased the concentration of, atmos of the atmospheric concentrations of CO2 by 50% since pre-industrial times. Nitrogen fixation has doubled. We've pumped out and depleted a lot of the world's aquifers. We've completely changed the abundance of, of biomass on this planet, right? So 60% of all mammal biomass is now livestock, 60%. If you look at the 
biomass of all wild uh, animals, it's now only something about 6% of the world's population, uh, of the world's biomass of, of mammals. It's, it's tiny in comparison. And this is then having huge impacts, right? So this is a, a feeding lot in, in the United States where they're growing beef. You get the industrial um, uh, feeding of the, the, these animals grown in these, these feedlots where they bring in grain. And then you can see the effluent, the, the, the feces and the, the, the urine getting washed away into these tailing ponds, these holding ponds. But a lot of those then leak and get into waterways. So if you take, for example, the Mississippi, and the next slide shows you the Mississippi Delta, um, this is the Mississippi River running down through New Orleans now until the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see here these huge algal blooms in the oceans. And um, this is eutrophication from overloading of nutrients in the, in the oceans, right? Um, these algal blooms uh, then uh, basically break down, the, the bacteria in the water column break down the, uh, and use up all the oxygen and they create oxygen dead zones across the whole of these kind of coastal areas. Uh, and any fish or any other uh, aquatic organism swimming into these areas, they would then basically suffocate, um, they, they die. So th these areas become completely anoxic and therefore hostile to life, right? And it's not just happening off the coast of the US, it's happening around many other areas too. In terms of fishing, we've now um, a third of all the fisheries are assessed to be overfished. That is that the stocks can't maintain themselves at the current levels of fishing. And the other thing, of course, is ocean acidification, right? Uh, the, the production of CO2 dissolves in ocean waters, makes them more acidic. Um, and so oceans are now 40% more acidic than they were in pre-industrial times. And if we keep going like this, they get so acidic that they basically start to dissolve the shells of the organisms that live in these oceans. And this was one of the key things that drove a lot of the mass extinctions in the past, right? So <clears throat> we're not just doing one thing to the climate, right? And, and it's not just about climate, it's about all of these environmental harms that are kind of combining to pick apart threads of life and, and break down the kind of the kind of functioning of ecosystems that we all depend upon. Um, so you might have heard of the kind of idea of the planetary boundaries concept. Um, this is uh, the idea that you know there are certain safe limits uh, that we have to stay within to keep the Earth system stable. Uh, and what we're finding is that already on many key indicators, we're overshooting those safe boundaries, um, including climate change already. Right. Um, so the further out we go from the safe boundary the more risk that we take and the more harm that we will encounter. So that, as far as I can sum it up in, in you know, 15, 20 minutes, the is, is, is the physical reality of, of where we are, right? This is, this is the state of the planet today. And as um, Professor Hans Schellenhuber, who is the director of the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research when, he's, when it was set up, says, political reality must be grounded in physical reality or else it's completely useless. And I think, as you all know, and, and I would definitely back up, you know, at the moment, political reality is completely divorced from this physical reality. We are not acting at all in line with what the science is explaining to us about the, the harms that we're causing. So let's step back again and go back to this valley where I, where I grew up and just really think about what is it that we're risking here? What, what is that it, it, that's on the line? And for me, you know, growing up here, this, this is my touchstone. This is where I go back to to think about this. So this is a glacial valley, right? This was formed uh, during the height of the last ice age about 20,000 years ago, when this entire area was basically <coughs> um, frozen. Right? Now, these are the ice ages going back 400,000 years, and it shows you just how closely CO2 and and, and temperature track each other, right? And this is kind of key evidence that scientists have for why um, you know, climate change is driven by uh, changing levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. So as CO2 levels go up, then temperature goes up. As CO2 levels go down, temperature goes down. It's, it's really clear from that, right? CO2 is kind of like a thermostat for the planet's climate. But you can see that there's kind of these swings right a, a sawtooth kind of swings and the, basically you get these warm periods which are known as interglacials and then it cools down into the kind of the glacial maximum and the last glacial maximum was about twenty thousand years ago and then we had this really rapid warming um, and that then then led to the holocene right the last ten thousand years and it's that last ten thousand years that uh, is the st was stable and you can see just how stable it was in comparison to, to the hundreds of thousands of years beforehand. That last 10,000 years was stable enough that humans could start settling down 
and, and predicting where the rains were going to fall. Could, they could predict where the coastlines were going to be. They could predict, uh, you know, um, when to plant and so on. And that then la allowed for civilization to emerge and not just in one place, but in many places around the world simultaneously and independently. You know, this was a real kind of turning point in human history. But you can also see here just the beginnings of the kind of uh, upshoot of CO2, right? Um, you know, as human industrialization takes place. And we haven't yet seen on this graph anyway, the, the, the corresponding shift in temperatures. I'll show you that in a second. Um, now, as I said, this is where I grew up, right? And I know all these mountains off by heart. This is off the top of Penarol ON looking across onto Snowden or with fire in the background. But if I was here 20,000 years ago and stood in the same spot, it would have looked like this, right? Here's the, the same valley, but completely full of ice with just these bare um, kind of um, islands of, of rock floating in the sea of ice, right? Nothing could live there. Nothing was alive there 20,000 years ago. But the key thing to understand is that the temperature difference on a global average between this ice age, when the whole of Europe was under a massive ice sheet, right? You had tundra across France, you had the, the tiger that we see now in, in the Siberian forests was across you know, the whole of Spain and Italy, right? The world was completely different back then. Um, the temperature difference was only about four and a half to five degrees Celsius on the global average. It sounds tiny, right? But these tiny changes can have huge repercussions for how the Earth system functions and, and the entire biomes will be completely rearranged. But this shift from the Ice Age to the pre-industrial times took place over tens of thousands of years, right? Um, the, the warming um, uh, happened gradually. Um, we're trying to do, we're gonna do potentially the same or a similar amount of warming within just a century. You know, life is not adapted cannot uh, change that quickly. Ecosystems cannot move, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in anything like that time scale. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, this is where we're headed. And again, this should be familiar, but let's put it on a more human time scale than we sometimes think about it, right? If we just look at the last century, my grandmother was born 100 years ago in 1923. My mum was born in 1958. And I was born in 1986 here, right? And you can see over that period of time, the world had warmed about one degree, okay? Now that one degree <clears throat> is already having all the impacts that we, we were talking about at the beginning of the lecture. But, you know, I don't have a kid, but were, were they born today? Well, actually I have a niece and a nephew, right? That were born a couple of years ago. So let's take them, right? So they're gonna finish school around here. Their first grandchild, if they choose to have one, will be born around, you know, their, their kid will be born around here. And then that child will, you know, my, my niece and nephew will retire around here at the end of the century, right? You know, in their lifetime, they're gonna see this huge transformation of the planet if we don't stop burning fossil fuels, right? Um, and yet, um, you know, we might be able to stabilize uh, and phase out fossil fuels, but even that's still gonna see dramatic changes from, from where we are now. So no matter what we do, we're kind of gonna see change continue but how much change is still very much determined by which of these scenarios, which of these pathways we end up going down. But just to put this in the, the context of the last 10,000 years, and I think this is really important to kind of understand why we're in an emergency, right? If we were to warm the planet by four degrees or even three degrees, this is what it looks like, right? It's, it's like hitting a brick wall in comparison to the last 10,000 years. We're completely leaving the envelope of stability that we've had for the entire Holocene to which all our infrastructures are adapted. And so, you know, all our agriculture, all our ports, all, everything has been built, uh, you know, uh, all our flood defenses, et cetera, they've all been built with certain tolerances. Uh, and those tolerances are, are kind of decided based on past experience. Past experience is gonna be no guide whatsoever to the future that we're headed to. And so this is a huge stress on our on our civilization and the systems, the social systems that we use to survive. So it's that understanding, that realization that that makes scientists like myself so concerned, right? That to, and as Antonio Guterres said when the last IPCC report was published um, last year, today's IPCC Working Group One report is a code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening, and the evidence is irrefutable. Greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and deforestation are choking our planet and putting billions of people at immediate risk. 
Global heating is affecting every region on Earth, with the many of the changes becoming irreversible. So this is the head of the UN completely getting it, understanding what the science is saying, and saying billions of people are threatened because of this. This is what the IPCC say in their report, right? Any further delay in concerted anticipatory global action on adaptation and mitigation will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. And they then conclude that they have very high confidence in this statement, right? That's as good as science can ever tell you. And so put another way, this is uh, from Jim Ski, who, who uh, was the co-chair of Working Group 3, um, and this is what his summary of, of that report published in April last year. It is now or never if we want to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Without immediate and deep emissions reductions across all sectors, it will be impossible. So we're in a climate emergency, right? This, that's what the science is telling us, and it's on our watch. So whether we like it or not, this is the time we live in. What are we gonna do with this time that we have in this state of emergency? How do we respond, all right? And just to really stress that the rest of the lecture, I'm just gonna kind of go, go over what does, what does it mean to be in an emergency and, and how can we communicate that, right? Um, this is from <clears throat> um, a paper published by the Blue Planet Prize laureates, right? So the, these were people who've been awarded um, um, the Blue Planet Prize um, for their contributions to environmentalism and, and, and protecting our, our planet, right? Um, they gathered all of the past winners together and they sat down and they 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 penned this paper um, outlining what they think was happening, what they think's happening, right? And they say, in the face of an absolutely unprecedented emergency, society has no choice but to take dramatic action to avert a collapse of civilization. Either we will change our ways and build an entirely new kind of global society, or they will be changed for us. That's what's at stake. And I don't think most people really grasp that. So scientists agree with this, right? They think that we're in an emergency too, right? So um, in 2019, uh, a, a, an article was published, a scientific paper was published, but it was unusual in the fact that it was signed by 11,000 scientists, right? Uh, so it was kind of like an open letter. And in this, they said, we declare with more than 11,000 scientist signatories from around the world, clearly and unequivocally that planet Earth is facing a climate emergency. This is not controversial. This is not a fringe position. This is very much how the mainstream scientific community now see this. I'm just gonna put up this equation. And I think, you know, for me as a scientist, I, I think this is really helpful, but I'm gonna break it down because I know a lot of people um, aren't always very comfortable with equations, right? One way of thinking about what an emergency is, is, is like this, right? <clears throat> We are in an emergency, E, if both the risk of the situation, R, and or the urgency of the situation are large. Okay. So in that case, <clears throat> we are in an emergency. But what do we mean by risk, right? Well, in the case of climate change, risk can be thought of like this, right? It is the likelihood of a given amount of warming and the corresponding impact that we would see from that impact, right? So the probability P multiplied by the damage D, the impact, and the damage don't scale linearly with the warming, right? So the hotter it gets, the, the, the much more impact that we will see, okay? And by multiplying the likelihood, the probability and the damage, we then get the risk, right? So that kind of gives you the distribution. And you can see that we should be really worried about these high impact, even if low probability events, um, because they, they actually are a real risk to our entire, to everything that we care about. The costs could be absolutely phenomenally huge. Urgency is given by this term, which is the reaction time. So the time it takes us to respond to an alert. So, you know, scientists put out a warning, how long does it take for, for the world to, to react to that and, and act on that warning, right? That's the reaction time. To compare to the intervention time, how long do we have to stop the um, planet from hitting really severe damage, right? And if the intervention time is short and therefore comparable to say the reaction time, 
that's really urgent, right? We haven't got long to, to get our act together to stop this. So by putting all of this together, I think we can see we're in an emergency. But here's how scientists might look at it, right? So we can assess the risk to different ecosystems from different levels of warming. And as we get hotter, the risks increase. Now there's different risks that we might be concerned about. So there's the risks to um, unique and threatened systems. There's the risks from certain kind of extreme weather events. There's the risks to certain regions of the planet. There's the risks to the global economy, or there's risks to kind of key earth system boundaries like tipping points in the earth system, right? Now, world governments have got together and they've argued about what is an unacceptable risk and what is an acceptable risk. Where's that limit, right? What's the threshold? And they've agreed at Paris that we have to limit global warming to well below two degrees and aim to stay, stay below 1.5, right? Because above that is deemed an unacceptable risk to humanity. But unfortunately, the risks actually look worse. So this was what the science looked like in 2001. But this is what it looked like when that was updated uh, a few, um, you know, um, a while later. And you can see that the risks have become greater. We now think that the, the, that the harms that we were trying to avoid will happen at a, at a closer level of global warming. And so, you know, there is this tendency, I think, for scientists to underestimate the pace that climate change can cause impacts. We're very good at predicting the, the rise in the global average temperature, but what that actually means for, for, for human societies and also eco ecosystems, actually we've sometimes underestimated that, right? And so here are some examples, and I think really alarming and serious examples, right? So this is Professor Michael Mann, a, a famous climate scientist saying, we are now 50 to 100 years ahead of schedule with the slowdown of the ocean circulation pattern relative to the models. The more observations we get, the more sophisticated our models become, the more we're learning that things can happen faster and with a greater magnitude than we had predicted just years ago. Right? He's talking about the, the Atlantic uh, um, current, the, the kind of the Gulf Stream current that, that moves heat across the Atlantic. You know, that, that could shut down and that would completely change the climate over Europe and, and also uh, you know, over parts of America, right? With huge implications for, for agriculture, for, for you know, um, all sorts of functions in our societies, right? And yet this is much closer possibly than we'd actually realized even a few, few years ago. Dr. Sue, Sue Natali is a, a, a scientist who worked on permafrost um, like I, I did up in the Arctic, right? And here she is saying, I would say that we're being quite conservative when we make our estimates about how much carbon will be released from the thawing permafrost because of these surprising events like the cr crazy wildfires that we're seeing in, the, uh, in, the, the, in Siberia and in uh, uh, Canada where I, I work, right? Um, and that's exactly, you know, why you know our estimates of what how much carbon we can afford to burn might be too generous right if these uh, permafrost soils start releasing carbon then we've got less time than we than we thought to get temperatures stabilized and here's tom slater a, a glaciologist saying although we anticipated the ice sheets would lose increasing amounts of ice in response to warming of the oceans and the atmosphere the rate at which they're melting has accelerated faster than we could have imagined the melting has overtaken the climate models we used to guide us, and we are in danger of being unprepared for the risks posed by sea level rise, right? So in many different ways, climate change could be worse than had been expected, right? The, the, um, it's gonna end, uh, 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 the impacts are gonna be on the high end of our uncertainty. And this was particularly concerning if it's true about earth system tipping points. So that equation I showed you came from this paper. It's a paper by Lenten et al. and a commentary published in, in Nature a few years ago, one of the leading scientific journals, right? And what they're saying is that actually these tipping points might be connected. So if you tip one of them, it then increases the probability that the next tipping point will follow, like a domino. And they're saying that that, that means that actually the risks could be higher than we think, but you know, if we cross one of them, it could start a cascade. So... <clears throat> If these damaging tipping cascades can occur and a global tipping point cannot be ruled out, then this is an existential threat to civilization, they say. No amount of economic cost-benefit analysis is going to help us. We need to change our approach to the climate problem. 
In our view, the evidence from tipping points alone suggests that we are in a state of planetary emergency. Both the risk and urgency of the situation are acute. And what they're drawing on, I think, to reach this conclusion is uh, their understanding of, of tipping points and, and how close those tipping points actually are. And as I said, the science is kind of solidified on this. Like, and as it's solidified, then our understanding of how close we are to these tipping points has unfortunately come closer. And so what we now think is that, you know, even in the Paris range shown here in this shaded blue bar of 1.5 to 2 degrees, even in that range, then things like the collapse of the Greenland ice sheet, parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet, the die off of coral reefs, some thaw of, of certain parts of the permafrost, um, and also the loss of sea ice in, in certain regions, all of those could be tipped, right? Um, and so we are kind of already at a point where we are now getting very close to very severe climate impacts. Um, some of these will take a long time to play out, but once you trigger them, you can't stop it, right? Whereas if we keep warming, then we start to hit even more of these tipping points, right? So, so you know, if we go beyond three degrees, we start seeing other ones. And if we get to four degrees, then there's even others, right? Um, and so <clears throat> this is what, why scientists are so concerned, because they know that these things could happen. And this is Professor David King, uh, you know, the former chief scientist of the UK um, government. And, that, you know, looking at this and he's saying, you know, you to put it into some kind of general context, you know, we've got, if you got into a plane with a one in 100 chance of crashing, you would be appropriately scared. You would not get on that plane. But we are experimenting with the climate, which sustains all of us, you know, every aspect of our lives in a way that throws up probabilities of a much more severe consequence uh, uh, of much more than that, right? We are taking huge, huge risks with our future and it makes no sense from a kind of a rational point of view. So just to conclude, because of the changes to our Earth system that we are causing, you know, climate change is a huge threat, but not just to our environment, though it is, right? Uh, as Greenpeace says, it is the greatest environmental threat that humanity has ever faced. But we depend on our environment, right? And so this is also a threat to human rights. It's as Mary Robinson, the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has said, it's the biggest human rights issue of the 21st century, right? It's the biggest global health threat of the 21st century, says The Lancet, the UK's leading medical journal. It presents security challenges of a magnitude and a complexity we've never seen before, says the former NATO Secretary General. It is the great, single greatest threat to sustainable development, says Ban Ki-moon. It is the greatest market failure the world has ever seen, says Lord Nicholas Stern, the UK climate economist, right? Climate change isn't one of these things. It is all of these things and how they interact with each other. So this is why it's such a threat to our, to our survival, to our civilization. And it's why we have to take action, right? So I'm going to stop there uh, on that depressing note. And then next week, we're going to look at what, what it is required for us to get to zero emissions, right? What, what would we have to do to stabilize the global climate um, at 1.5 or even 2 degrees? And why, if we're trying to do that, there can be no new oil and gas?